Hey everyone, it is October. And every year we kick off October 1st with my birthday because it is Libra season, everybody. Most importantly, yesterday was my 40th birthday, a pretty big milestone. And in this episode, I am going to share with you five important ways to show up for yourself. These five lessons I have learned over my last year around the sun, and these are lessons that you can take away and apply to your own life because it's never too late to start working on you. Hi, everyone. You are listening to Beyond, and I'm your host, Dr. Flora. Listen, life is hard. You don't have to do it alone. As a mindset coach, physician, mom, and an infertility warrior, I have mastered techniques to help move you towards contentment and growth. I can't wait to go along with this crazy ass life journey with you while making sure you feel like your best self. This podcast is meant to have you feel unstuck from your rut and less alone. Let's do this. So first and foremost, thank you for being here. I'm proud of you. It's hard to work on yourself. And what I always mention is if you don't know what to work on, if you don't have a project, if you are in any rare moment bored, choose you. Always default to you. Prioritize you. So I've never really been a zodiac sign personality trait person until I got pregnant with Gia. Now, our baby girl was supposed to be born in early mid-September, aka she was supposed to be a Virgo, which a lot of people would come up to me And while I was pregnant, they'd ask when I would be due and I would mention September and I'd get these comments like, oh, she's going to be a Virgo baby. She's going to be a Virgo baby. And I'm like, oh, okay. Didn't really mean too much to me. My mom's a Virgo. My sister's a Virgo. I don't know. We all kind of get along and I didn't think much of it. But then Miss Gia decided that she had special plans and she wanted to come out a little early. She ended popping out in the beginning of August, six weeks premature. That's right. That makes her a Leo. So then I got all these comments about, ooh, you got a Leo on your hands. Ooh, you better get ready. I just got all these, like, the tone change. The I got these warning signs instead. So then I started looking into zodiac signs and personality traits Let me tell you, friends, our girl is a true Leo inside and out. Like she kind of ticks off all those check boxes when it comes to Leo energy personality. And I started looking into my Libra traits. Now, I fully realize (laughs) that I am a physician. I fully realize that I'm a scientist and I'm a traditionally Western medicine trained doctor. Like I can't rely on the epitome, uh, randomized controlled trial type data. I Googled all of this and I learned that way. So the zodiac sign of Libra is usually depicted as, as a set of scales. And that makes sense because as Libras, we are obsessed with symmetry and we strive for equilibrium. We are good at solving conflicts, more so because it throws off our equilibrium, and we are good at building balanced relationships. We shift moods in a soft, subtle way, meaning that Most of the time, we're not loud and in your face, but we do have an impact. We are great communicators. We are the happiest when we are in strong relationships. Sound good, right? I think they all sound good. But now on the flip side, 
Libras can be overthinkers, melodramatic, ugh, rude, uh, insecure, and fickle. So let's keep all of these in mind as we go through the episode. Birthdays, I know, can be complicated for a lot of people. They come with a lot of complex emotions. And because I'm a Libra and I don't like feeling conflicted, I've naturally spent a lot of time unpacking why birthdays tend to be complex for me. Now, we all have that friend, like that friend who knows exactly what they want for their birthday, what theme, where they want it, who they want there, and they go for it. They ask for it. They make the plans and their loved ones show up. My daughter's one of those. You know what? Leo's, many of my Leo friends are like that and they love their birthdays and they go for it. And over the years, I have not been that. There have been many birthdays in the past where I felt disappointed, upset, unloved, guilty. I mean, you can ask my husband. Struggled for a while. That brings me to lesson number one. Stop asking your partner, your family, your friends, stop asking them to be mind readers. This doesn't only apply for your birthday. This applies like for life. We need to learn how to communicate effectively and efficiently and with love and compassion. But because we're talking about my birthday, let's use birthdays as an example. For the longest time, I really didn't like my birthday. I want on my birthday to feel celebrated, to feel loved, to feel prioritized. And anything less than that would bring such a deep level of disappointment and this feeling of abandonment that I was so scared to feel. Like as a Libra, like I don't want to feel out of my balance, right? So I don't want to even go there. I would keep my expectations like zero, very low. But I would also deep down expect the love and the adoration and all the good stuff. So I remember this one birthday very, very clearly. It was a particularly busy year and I had passively verbalized, oh my God, I need to rest. Like it's, I'm just so tired. I'm so busy. We had a lot of expenses that year. So I also had made passive comments about saving money. I wasn't happy with how I physically looked. So then I would passively make comments about not wanting to eat out as much. So my husband, my wonderful, wonderful husband, took all of those passive comments and planned my birthday appropriately. So on my birthday, Sanjay planned a beautiful hike. He didn't get me a present and he cooked a beautiful meal, a wonderful, delicious meal at home. He's a great cook. So I was happy. But then I remember not being happy. I'm like, wait, I want my gift. Wait, I want to be treated to a nice dinner. Wait, I kind of wanted all my friends there. And of course, I didn't say anything because he took a lot of time to plan, to cook, to just listen and deliver. So I kept quiet. But then I also felt guilty for being disappointed. I felt really ashamed. I felt really ungrateful. I felt like a spoiled little Libra child. That led me to feel angry at myself, and also resentful towards my husband because I expected him to just know what I wanted, even though I was verbalizing something separate, unrelated to my birthday, but just verbalizing passive comments about life in general. So then I started taking a page from my wonderful Leo loved ones books. I started asking for exactly what I wanted for my birthday each year. I started communicating and without guilt, mind you, because I realized that I have worked hard to surround myself by people who love me and they want to celebrate me. And they also saw my birthday as a day to help deliver those wonderful emotions and feelings. So I stopped expecting things without communication. 
And I asked. I also realized like no one is like planning my birthday for a year except me. (laughs) Everyone has their own priorities that they're juggling. But because I trusted who surrounds me, I know they were going to show up. That leads me to lesson number two. Know your love language. If you're not familiar with love languages, love languages refer to five simple ways that we want love to be shown to us and ways that we can show others that we care. This expands beyond romantic relationships, by the way. This can be carried over to any relationship. And as women specifically, I think we can, I I can speak from my own perspective, we generally don't put ourselves first and we are riddled with guilt when we do put ourselves first. On the flip side, we also build resentment because we need time to ourselves. We're human and we want to feel like we're being taken care of. So let's just stop that cycle, right? It just makes more sense to do that. Remember, you deserve to be loved in the way you want to feel valued, included, and validated. So first, figure out your love language. Take the quiz. Go to google.com, type in the love language quiz, and quickly take it. Okay, so let's quickly go over what the love languages are. Uh, Number one are words of affirmation. So this is telling others what you admire about them, how you appreciate them. For example, thank you for taking the time to make me breakfast this morning. Uh, Number two, acts of service. So doing something kind for someone or lending a helping hand, um, like taking out the trash or not waiting to be asked to clean the dishes, so on and so forth. Language number three, gifts. This is pretty self-explanatory. It could be meaningful gifts. It could be expensive gifts. That is for you to figure out what is more meaningful to you and if that's high up on your list. Love language number four is quality time. So having someone's undivided attention is precious, especially in our day of tech. So that means no TV, no phones, no other conversations, just one-on-one connection quality time, love language number four. Now, the last one is physical touch, also pretty self-explanatory, but again, it doesn't have to be a romantic thing. A handshake, a fist bump, a gentle pat on the upper back, a hand on the shoulder, arm, all of those are examples of physical touch. And if that is your love language, that can make you feel valued. So don't forget, go to Google, type in love language quiz, have your friends take it, have your partners, your kids, your other family members take it. It's actually a really fun way to learn something about not only yourself, but about others. So next time it's someone else's birthday, you're not giving them what you think you'd want. You are giving them what you know they want. I know it's a little bit of a tongue twister, but think about that. (laughs) Lesson number three, start something before you are ready. Just start it. As a Libra, I am a perfectionist and it has taken me a long time to let go of that need for perfectionism tendencies because I recognized it was causing low self-esteem and it guaranteed me to reach failure more often Because I was trying to reach for the impossible. And this is something that I encounter in my coaching clients very, very frequently. We got to let go of that perfectionism mindset. So as a recovering perfectionist, I have been working hard to start before I am 100% ready. When I reduced my hours from clinical medicine, I, I wanted to focus more on coaching, on starting this podcast. But I had to learn quickly to jump on these opportunities before I was like a thousand percent ready and a thousand percent educated about it. I launched this podcast in February 2024. Do you know that I actually started thinking about this podcast in January 2023? Like I had podcast cover pages drafted on my computer from 20. 23. That's how long I had been thinking about it. So at the end of 2023, when I started to 
take some less hours in the clinic, I realized I just had to put a deadline on my ass to launch this podcast. I knew it's what I wanted to do. It felt good in my gut because it fulfilled my purpose. I knew I wanted to get my message out there to more of you. I knew I wanted to connect with more of you. And this was the way to help you all be the best version of yourself. So I started researching how to launch a podcast. Literally, that's what I Googled. Started taking notes. I started writing episodes. I started recording, editing. I hired a wonderful team. Shout out to my virtual assistant team um, to help edit and, and help me launch this. When we launched in February, it wasn't perfect. There were things that I'm like, oh, what if this happens? I don't know what to do with this. Well, how should I write this? What do I do with the intro? What about ads? What about sponsorship? What about any of that? At this point in time, I still don't have a sponsor and I don't have ads, but I knew it was going to be a gradual process. I knew it was going to be a learning process. So since February, we have learned from less than ideal approaches and simply pivoted. And we pivoted to help make this feel like the best it can be. So stop waiting. It's okay to do your research, but just do it. Because if you wait for perfectionism, it's never going to happen. Lesson number four, don't give in to mean people. Now, this sounds really obvious, but I promise you it is not. Let me start with the story. So I was at an event, and I'm not going to go into details about when or where or what event because I don't want to give anything away, but it was at an event where there were many people who were more publicly known And there was this person, let's call her person Y. I have met person Y a multitude of times. We share a a very good mutual friend. And even before I met person Y in person, um, we had exchanged a few DMs, just very nonchalant. But once you meet someone multiple times, you know, you do expect to acknowledge each other. May, you may not have like great in-depth conversations, but like a, hey, how's it going? A simple conversation is expected from there on. But time and time again, I would run into person Y at different events in person, by the way, this was not virtual. And she continued to look right past me, like not acknowledge me, not even make eye contact, not even be near me to the point where I can't pull her aside and say, hey, how are you? And I never really figured out why person why would act like this. So let me get back to this event. I arrived with Sanjay, my husband, and a very good friend of mine and her husband. We all walk in to the front door. We open the front door and the first person we see standing there is person Y and her significant other. And by default, this is like my natural reaction. I'm like, oh, I know this person. Let me, and she's alone. Let me reach out and say hi. So as I am approaching her, because she is the only person in my eyesight and I, her, I reach out to her to say, hi, how are you? Oh my God, good to see you. Whatever I had in my head. In that same moment, she goes to my good friend and she had outstretched arms, gives her this big hug and says, oh my gosh, I am so happy to see you. I knew nobody here. And she managed to place herself right in front of me, separating Sanjay and I and my friend and her husband. Sanjay saw this whole thing, by the way. And he knew the backstory of the times where she kind of just looked past me. I just looked at Sanjay. I'm like, let's keep walking. There are plenty of other people that we actually know that would acknowledge us. And we kept walking and we let it go. And I, I just remember thinking, I still can't believe this is happening in our 30s, 40s. Like, this is the shit that I talk about with my nine-year-old fourth grader and her friend drama. But here we are. Yes, grown-ass women who are, you know, some of them are acting like assholes. Now, the old me would have turned the mean behavior of person Y and internalize it. I would take the behavior of someone with an ingenuine agenda 
who would not put their kindest foot forward and ask myself, what did I do wrong? I would blame myself for others' shitty behavior. And then as I grew up, that morphed into more into rumination, like with anger and frustration and resentment, where my inner narrative to that behavior became, how dare she? I'll show her. But that also took up a lot of energy. So I'm going to tell you something that I need you to write down and remember. I want you to take this to heart. You truly feel free when you free yourself of judgment. Judgment from yourself, judgment from others. Keep your actions and words grounded in kindness, in compassion, and in your purpose, regardless of what others around you are doing. All of that, let that shit go. Look, you're allowed to feel hurt and angry by someone else's actions, especially if this person is not close to you. Like we're human, but also learn to just drop it. I don't like carrying shit around, do you? Shit stinks. It smells up the place. It gets heavy. Let that ugly, smelly shit go. Finally, lesson number five, double down on your boundaries. Now, you all know I love my boundaries, but this year around the sun, my boundaries were challenged. Oh, they were tested. And I I think it's safe to say that they were tested as much as they were tested while I was going through infertility. That's a bold statement, but they were definitely challenged to a similar extreme. And what made it even harder is that it had to do with family, like all the family. I'm talking about in-laws, my side, and all the extended family. Now, notice I didn't say I had obstacles against my family. They just had to deal with family, which is always a little bit harder, right? There's so many different layers to our relationships with our family members. The end of 2023 and most of 2024 were filled with challenges because we saw a lot of family pretty frequently. As most of you know, My father had been battling a multitude of health issues without a primary underlying diagnosis until pretty recently. And even then, that diagnosis is relatively new, like newly discovered new. And it has been a challenge to see my dad in this state. We all know that our parents aren't superhuman. We all know that, you know, they're eventually going to um, have health issues and pass away. But, you know, when that notion becomes a possible reality, oof, it breaks you. And we've had the episode about grief where a good friend of mine, Brandy Malloy Simon, came on here and talked about. Um, the passing of her dad, her hero, one of the closest people to her, and how she dealt with grief. And it was heartbreaking to listen to. And I would take that and relate it to all the stuff that my dad had gone through. Not only did I have to learn how to place boundaries just with the family, but I had to learn how to put boundaries on myself. I had to learn how to be involved with my dad's health care how to be involved with my mom's emotions, how to support the both of them, how to communicate with my siblings who are just as involved, and also compartmentalize so it doesn't overtake my entire life. Many of us are in this sandwich generation where we are caretakers for our young kids and we have aging parents whom we're finding ourselves being caretakers to, to a certain extent. And many of us are working full time and, or we don't live with or nearby our parents. So I had to figure out how to formulate these boundaries with myself. So I didn't let all the angst and the rumination, all the what ifs take over 
really take over. I had so many emotions in addition to the anxiety of like the unknown and the worry of the unknown. I had a lot of anger and frustration. You all know our parents, as they age, become more stubborn and it's difficult for them to be in a place where they are asking their kids for help, right? For the longest time as parents, they were our caretakers. And now we're slowly blending those roles and possibly switching them. That's a hard position to be in. But with that comes a lot of resistance and a lot of stubbornness. And on the flip side, I mean, of course, a natural reaction is frustration and anger. I had to learn how to channel all of that so it wouldn't take over my entire life life. Like I, at one point I had trouble sleeping. I couldn't, you know, focus at work. I couldn't focus on podcasting because all these things were swimming and, and texts were flying. There were different threads between my siblings and extended family and my parents and one of my siblings and all of my siblings. And there was a thread without my parents, with my parents. I mean, it was a lot to juggle until I learned how to double down on my boundaries with myself. Cause I knew this was going to hurt my psyche. Another example, my family threw a wedding this year. My beautiful younger sister got married this summer. And if you all know, throwing a big fat Indian wedding from the hosting side is no joke. And then take an extra layer and put it on top of that, make it a destination wedding. And then on top of that, have an ill parent. And, And, you know, let's just pile on the layers and let's carry that over. It was hard. And I'm talking about extended family, my sister, my sister's in-laws side and all the drama that came there. I mean, none of this is smooth, right? And if we ever expect it to be smooth, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So for the wedding, I knew as the host family, I wasn't going to have time to make sure I sleep my full eight hours, get a lot of water, exercise, watch my nutrition. Like I wasn't going to really have the time and energy to do that. And I've gotten pretty good at kind of eyeballing some stuff. But I did know that among all the stress I was probably going to be triggered, whether it's from my immediate family, extended family, maybe my husband, my child, lots of stress uh, layered on top of each other. So before we left, I walked myself through all the triggers that I knew would likely come and I practiced compartmentalizing. I had my boundary statements ready to go. I had my actions, my boundary actions planned out. I even discussed them with Sanjay so he could utilize them and also support me in the process. It was the best thing we could do. Because even though that week was stressful as hell with a lot of ups and downs, we ended it at a high point. And we made core memories and we all had a wonderful, wonderful time. And it was so good to see my family. And the last example where I had to really double down on my boundaries this last year, we had a major family reunion with Sanjay's entire side of the family. I am talking about 50 brown people from all around the world three different generations, ages two to mid eighties, all doing a family reunion cruise to Europe. I mean, travel is already stressful, but we got different personalities. We got jet lag. We got just completely off of our routine and out of our environment. There's so many things that could impact your mindset. So I doubled down on things that knew would make me a sane person. Like I doubled down on sleep, movement, and water. Simple, right? Like, but on vacation, many of us go through like the all or nothing mindset. We're like, oh, I'm on vacation. I don't need to exercise. I don't need to drink water. I don't need to eat healthy. I don't need to watch what I'm doing. When in reality, you come back from the travel and all of a sudden you're upset because you have just negated a lot of hard work with the one week of vacation. So I let go of the all or nothing mindset and I doubled down on my boundaries with sleep, 
nutrition, water, movement. So yes, I went to sleep at a reasonable time, made sure I got my eight hours just so I could adjust to the jet lag because I am not a nice person when I don't get sleep. Yes, I went to the gym on the cruise ship. And if I wasn't able to go to the gym, I made sure I got enough steps in. So again, I felt like myself. Yes, I ate balanced plates. Yes, we were on a cruise. I made sure I had protein and fiber and good carbs and good fats on my plate every single meal. Was I perfect? No. Did I sometimes overeat? Yeah. But about 90% of the time, I was in a good place. So of course, when I feel good, I feel more confident and I can manage a lot of the stressors better. And that's just any of us because we're all human. Oh, also I chugged water and peed around the clock. I just had to make peace with all of that. So There you guys go. Five birthday lessons from me to you. Lessons that can benefit you not only on your birthday, but for your life. I hope you wrote these down. Stop expecting mind reading. Know your love language. Start before you're ready. Don't give in to mean people. And double down on your boundaries. For those who struggle on their birthdays for the same reasons I do with these complex, complicated emotions, I just want to say I see you, I hear you, I've been there, I'm still sometimes there. But remember, don't wait for anybody to make you happy. Know that you do have control over your happiness. You can make yourself happy. Just ask. Don't forget to prioritize you. All right, Beyond listeners, I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for joining and spending your precious time here with me. As someone who prioritizes her energy, I am so grateful that you chose to spend yours here. To help me help you, please take an extra 30 seconds of your time to rate and review the podcast on your listening platform. For more tips and a behind the scenes look into my life, follow me on Instagram at Dr. Flora Sinha. That's Dr. Flora Sinha. Finally, connecting with you truly fills my cup. So DM me on Instagram, email me at florasinhamd at gmail.com. Repost if you love this episode. I love, love hearing from you. I am so grateful for you and cannot wait to be back for the next episode. Bye.